thinking about yours. You, you, you're not thinking about what God wants. You're thinking about what you want. The perfect comes when maturity and he came to grow us up. Amen. I wish everybody was here to hear this, but they're not, so we can go on with it. Several years ago, I was just a kid. I had the, I was born with asthma. And it was it was bad. I mean, I a few times as a child, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. In the middle of the night, you just the, the airways just clog up. You can't breathe. You just you gasping for breath. <coughs> well, there was a at Granny's house. There was a refrigeration plant right next door to her, and they used that sulfur gas. And I was out in the yard playing one day, and one of them thing broke loose over there and, and all that supper gas and I just took one whip of that boy I went into all kinds of couldn't breathe. I mean I was laying out in the yard, couldn't breathe. I was just a kid. Now my grandmother was a praying woman. She she saw to it that her family went to church. She was keeping me that day. Mama was at work, daddy was at work. And and uh, I was just a kid so here I'm laying out there and Granny sees me. And she comes running out, and an old man was coming down the road. That, this is a true story. Old man was coming down the road, the street, in a wagon, horse-drawn wagon, full of vegetables, selling them vegetables in the community. And Granny recognized him. He was a member of the church over there, where 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 we went to church. And uh, she said. Brother Hicks, Brother Hicks, Brother Hicks. And he pulled the old horse over the side. She said, come here and pray for my grandson. Now, Brother Hicks had one eye, more like that, looked a little bit like Popeye. <laughs> and he had, uh, one of his fingers was half missing, I don't know what, and, and part of the other, I don't know what happened to it. And he walked with a limp. Walked with a with a severe limp. And he got off of that vegetable wagon and came over there, got <coughs> down on one knee, and all I'm thinking is, in my condition, think, I, I can't breathe, but all I'm thinking is, how come you walk funny? <laughs> is that childish or what? <laughs> How come you walk funny? I, I couldn't say it, couldn't breathe. But that's what I was thinking. That old man got down on one knee and put the hand that was missing fingers on my head and started speaking in an unknown tongue. Boy, he went to town. All of a sudden, I could breathe. Nothing had changed. Except all of a sudden, I could breathe. Because that old man had a relationship with God. He did not look the part. If I had been looking for a healer that day, I wouldn't have picked him. He would have been last in the line. But God don't see like we see. He is not looking for the best person. He's looking for the right person. All of a sudden, I'm up and running around the yard some more. When I got older, I thought about that many times. When I got older, it dawned on me one day. There was an old man in the Bible who walked funny. His name was Jacob. <laughs> you can't go 
go by what something looks. Amen. You can't go by the way you think about it. You have to trust God. My life was literally saved that day. Yeah. I probably would have just laid there and died, I guess. There wasn't no medicine back in them days for stuff. And if there had been, we couldn't have afforded it. We were poor. That old man driving the vegetable wagon came down the road at just the exact time. Not looking to part. Not knowing that he was on a mission from God. God can orchestrate it better than you can. He can figure it out before you can even see the problem. I want to tell you we have to learn to trust God and hear the truth. What's better than trusting the plan? Yes, that's right. Trusting the God yes. behind the plan. Like that. That's right. Yes. Woo! Mm -hmm. Show you something. I got a little gizmo. I don't know. Let me back up and see if I can make you see me better. This is a little gizmo here that has four dots on it. See them? This bottom dot here is, is Fred's house. That's where Fred lives. Up on the top here is, is the dairy farm where you can go get a quart of milk. And uh, over, over here on this side is, is the grist mill. Does anybody know what a grist mill is? Mm -hmm. Huh? Grist. Huh? That's where that you go to get your wheat or barley or rye or whatever whatever kind of grain you got. You go down there and uh, to the grist mill and get it ground by a big stone that either a water wheel is powering or or something. You know, sometimes they have mules. But anyway, I, I went to, to one with my grandpa on, on a few occasions. So you got Fred's house, you got the dairy farm, and over here, you got the grist mill, and over here is where Aunt Betsy lives. <laughs> so now, Fred is in the need of some cornbread. And he don't make very good cornbread, but Aunt Betsy sure does. Yeah. Now, Fred wants some corn bread. So what he figures is, I'm going to get me some milk from the dairy and some grain, some cornmeal from the grist mill, and I'm going to go to Aunt Bessie's house and get her to make me some cornbread. <laughs> so what he's doing here is, he's figuring out a way to get it done. A most efficient way. So here's what he said. Now I'm going to go up here to the dairy farm and get me some milk and come back and put my ice box back. In those days we didn't have refrigerator. Right. Yeah. I'm going to get it and, and, and come back here and put it in my, in, in, in my ice box. Then I'm going to go over here to the to, to the grist mill. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to get me some, some, some corn meal mm -hmm. and I'm going to come back to my house and then I'm going to go to Aunt Bessie's house. She's going to make me some cornbread. And then I'm going to go back home. So now here you see, Fred has gone one trip, two trips, three trips, four trips, five trips. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Count going back home. He made six trips <coughs> to get some cornbread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aunt, Aunt Bessie says to him before before he leaves, she said, well, well, why don't I just go up and get the, 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 the milk and come on down to your house. You 
go over to the grist mill and get the grain and come back down to your house and we'll make some cornbread there and then I'll go home. <laughs> so, he's going to go over here and back. That's two trips. Then she's going to go up here and down here and then back here. That's three trips. So you still got five trips between the two of them. But old Fred, I mean, old, he, he just prayed. Now, Lord, I need me some cornbread. And I don't want to waste a lot of time and a lot of effort, so just, just show me how to do it. So the Lord said, okay, Fred, here's what you do. You go to the grist mill and get the grain. Then go up here to the to the dairy and get the milk and then go over here to Betsy's house and y'all have you some good can, uh, uh, cornbread and then you go home. And now he's only going one, two, three, four trips. Mm -hmm. So God had a good idea. Yes, he did. <laughs> Even when there's a plethora of alternatives, God's got not a way, but the way. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am a way, a truth, and a life. Is that what he nope. said? Nope. No, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. God's always got a way, but we gloss over it sometimes because we don't take the time and the effort to hear, to listen. Because God always knows the best way for something. And it won't, it hardly ever be like you thought it ought to be. That's true. Hardly ever. You know why? My ways are not your ways. Who said that? My ways are not yours. You'd be running back and forth to Aunt Bessie's and up to the, to the barn and over yonder to the... I told you how to get it, so we'll just go do it. Now, four lepers were sitting outside the gate of Samaria. They were surrounded by enemies, and the enemy was going to starve them out. God caused a, a noise to come in the top of the trees, and the enemy, the Syrians, thought it was enemy stirring. They got all uh, excited and, and panicked and, and started bumping into each other, running to, to, to get away. The next morning, those four lepers, they didn't know what was going on. Inside the gates of that city, a man called Elijah had prophesied. Tomorrow about this time, there will be plenty. He didn't have any evidence of that. How did he know? He heard it. He heard God say it. Those lepers, they weren't in the city. They didn't hear that. They didn't know. They were just out there trying to die. So the next morning, one of them has an idea. You know, I got a feeling this might have been an old boy named Gehazi. Gehazi was the servant of Elijah. And when Naaman came to Elijah to be healed, Elijah said, you go on down yonder to, uh, to, the, to the river, Jordan River, and dip seven times and you will be clean. He was, he was a leper. Well, uh, that made him mad. He said, we got cleaner rivers down there where I come from. I don't know why you got to put me in a nasty river like this. <laughs> He said, well, you just going home sick then. <laughs> but it, and one of his servants said, look, if he'd have told you to do something great, you would have done it. So your life's at stake here. Why don't you we'll just try this out and see? So he goes on there, he dips seven times, and when God says seven, six won't do. <laughs> if he'd have dipped five times, he'd have went away leprous. He'd have, if he'd have dipped six times. He done went away left. you got to follow God fully. All the way. So he dipped seven times, came up clean. The Bible says his skin was like a baby's butt. Well, I didn't say butt. <laughs> like a baby's butt. Came up 
uphill. And so uh, he tried to pay uh, Elijah, you know, give him some money. And he said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking it. So he says, well, all right then. So he goes on his way. But Gehazi, uh, Elijah's servant, says, this, this looks like a good opportunity. So he goes chasing after me. He says, my master sent me, and he said there's some need. And, and uh, if you'll just give us part of what you're offering, uh, it'll be good. And so he, he does. And so Gehazi takes it and goes and hides it and goes back home. And he walks in, and, and Elijah says, where you been? <laughs> That's like my mama. My mama. I couldn't, you couldn't fool my mama? She knew. And if she didn't know, she made you think she knew. You, you know, getting something past my mama like trying to sneak sunshine past the rooster. So he said, where you been? He says, oh, I, I was just out taking care of some business. He says, did my heart not go with you when you went to Naaman? and took from him. He said, therefore, the leprosy that was on Naaman is now on you. And he went out a leper. He might have been the fourth leper outside the gate. And all of a sudden, the next morning, he didn't know any better. He was just dying. He said, well, we're dying anyway. We might as well get up and go on up there to the Syrian camp and see if they'll have mercy on us and give us a handout. At least we'll have something to eat today. Either that or we just or, or we just sit here till we die. Why sit here till we die? So they get up and go up there and they found the whole place vacated. I mean, it, they them people moved out and didn't take nothing with them. They were running scared. And there was food to eat. Oh, there was jewels. See, they didn't just come from went about. They came to move in. So all their stuff was up there. And so here's these four lepers up there living like kings, just eating whatever they eat. Boy, I'm telling you. And, just, and all of a sudden, I believe it might have been Gehazi. He says, we do not well. This is a day of glad tidings and we hold our peace. You know, that might be something we need to hear here today. This is a day of glad tidings. Anyway, they said, let's go down and tell them. So they went down and shouted and told them. And so the people from the city came out, you know, and then, they, you know. Well, to, to make a, a, a long story longer, that day there was plenty to eat, just like the Word of God said. But isn't it funny that God didn't look for the best qualified to bring the victory? Four castaway lepers they wouldn't even let inside the city limits. Those are the ones that God used. He's not going to ask you to vote on it. He's not going to ask your opinion about it. He's going to make a decision and then see and see how you either respond or react to it. Because he will get the job done. He always does. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.11, according to his purpose, he worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Not your will. His will. Now, let, let, let me shuck it right on down to the car. When I, Isaiah 53, 80 says, it's not my way, it, it, or my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Seems to me like I heard that one time before somewhere, maybe it was over like in uh, Gethsemane, where Jesus said, not my will, but thy will. You know what he was saying? Not my way, but your way. Because Jesus had just prayed, oh, if it be possible. He never prayed if something was possible before. It was only in Gethsemane where he prayed that prayer, where his sweat was great drops of blood under extreme <coughs> duress and pressure. Lord, if it be possible, let's find another way to do this. And all of a sudden he said, Oh, excuse me, Father, nevertheless, not my way, 
but your not my will, but thou. Didn't he tell us that that's how we ought to pray? Mm -hmm. yeah. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will. That's how the kingdom comes. And that's how God's people grow up and become Christ to the world. That's how we become his hands and his feet. By growing up, hearing from him. Now then, 1 Corinthians, turn with me in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. Are, 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 are y'all tired and weary? No. Well, you'd say that. Not of this. Not of this. Benny's not as tired as y'all are. He hadn't been here long. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Okay, you're terrible. First Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God, God, hath God not made the, the foolishness, the, hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see how your call, now he's making it personal. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble are called. What is, what is he calling these people here? <laughs> then in verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God's not going to choose like you choose. He don't see it like you see it. God's got a way that will befugle you. You could never have thought of it and figured it out. But it will come to you. If you trust him. Now, let's break this down. He says here, God hath chosen foolish things. That means unreasonable things, absurd things, irrational things, illogical things, outrageous, ridiculous, senseless, weird, stupid, and crazy things. I'm sorry, y'all, that's what it means in the Greek. God has chosen that to confound the wise. That means to baffle, to puzzle, to perplex, to bewilder, to astonish, to disturb, to rattle. In other words, God has chosen to use crazy, wild, weird, stupid things to baffle and perplex and disturb and rattle the wise. And he has chosen weak things. That means feeble, inadequate, ineffective, impotent, incapable, helpless, barren, and sterile. You wouldn't choose any of those things, but God has chosen those kinds of things. 
And he's chosen base things. That means inferior things. Insignificant, menial, unimportant, worthless, pitiful, measly, and lowly. God hath chosen those things. And despised things. That means hated things, rejected things, spurned, deplorable, deplorables. Seems like I heard a politician call some people that. Deplorable. Disesteemed, neglected, disregarded, disapproved, disdained. Those are the things that God has chosen. And then he goes on to say the things which are not. To bring to naught the things which are. The things which are not, that means nobody's. Non-existent things. Null and void things. Empty things. Vacant things. Hollow things. Blank things. Nothing. Crumbs. Those are the things that God has chosen. Why? Because he don't need the great. He don't need the lifted up and the highly exalted. God can take the dust off the ground and make a human being. He don't need your help. He needs your obedience. God has a plan. He needs The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? This gift, this calling, this anointing, this ear to hear. We have it in earthen vessels. And so that's what God uses. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 14, 1 says this. Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent that word more excellent means a more mature way. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Now let me tell you a secret. We've always thought that the <coughs> more excellent way was charity or love, which is great. That is wonderful. But then Paul gets over into the next chapter and he says, follow after. Seek the best gifts and follow after uh, th those things. He said, but i show you a more excellent way. Follow charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Now he's not telling you to become a prophet. Right. He is telling you to speak the word of God out of your mouth. Rhema. Yes. What is it? What is what is the more, more excellent way? Speaking God's word through the human instrument. You don't have to be a prophet to do it. All you gotta know is what his word says. Speak it. And when you are speaking God's word, the Holy Ghost automatically anoints that. And it becomes a rainbow. Now there are prophets. But you can be prophetic. Speaking rainbow. What are you saying preacher? I'm saying that we need to operate in the most excellent way we can. And that is to know the truth and speak. In spiritual maturity, not like children playing church games, S growing up into Him in all things, speaking the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we want our nation to be free, if we want our land to be blessed, it needs to be in our mouth. On wings of his word. Okay, all you friends. <laughs> I've shown you a more excellent way today by the Holy Ghost. And I trust that you have learned and that you will be changed by it and you'll be better for having heard it.
Thank you, Father, for these precious people. We pray over each and every one who is here that their hearts will be filled as they leave, that their minds will be sharp as they leave, that their bodies will be healed as they leave, that their steps will be lighter, their heads will be held high, their faith will be strong, and that their future will be absolutely bright. For Lord, we believe that the best is yet to come. Yes. Pray over every tither and every giver that you would anoint them, but also anoint the seed that they sow into this place. And Father, I pray for those who are not here today. I pray for Pat. Yes, mm -hmm. Pray for Lois. Yes. Pray for Pam. Yes. Pray for Leslie. Pray for Robert. Pray for Lee. Yes. Pray for Violet. Yes. Pray for Dolores. I pray for Charlene. I pray for everybody, Lord, that is a part of this group. And Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus. You would do the same thing for them that you are doing for us and that you would bring healing, that you would bring solution and help, bring miracles into our lives and through our lives and put the truth in my, our mouths that we may speak rhema to a lost and hurting world and to a disgusted nation. Father, in Jesus' name, bring healing, heal our land, and use us as mature Christian believers to be a part of the process. And Lord, just to say it one more time, not our way, but your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.